Welcome. Welcome to this masterclass uh, with Jolene Gandia. My name is uh, Maurice van Rooyen. I work at Innovation and Procurement at Commando Materials and IT of, Ma of the Ministry of Defense. Normally, Diedrich High of Piano does the introduction, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to present today. It is my privilege to introduce yet another masterclass which adds knowledge to innovation-driven procurement at the Ministry of Defense. Uh, after Pro Professor Louise Knight of University Twente, who talks about the need to talk with markets and professor, professor Fido Smulders about entrepreneurial innovation. Today, Dr. Jolene Grandia will discuss major developments of and trends in the field of public procurement and how change agents can bring public procurement into a new era, a subject that is near to my heart, obviously, for the people who know me. So Dr. Jolene Grandia is assistant professor of the public management and uh, program director at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, her research is focused on transformations in public procurement, such as decentralization of youth and home care and implementation of sustainable public procurement. Her research combines insights from public administration, organization stu studies, change management and purchasing. Recently, she has published a free book called Public Procurement with Theory, Practices and Tools. The link to that book, if you don't have it yet, is in the chat, so you can download it anytime you want. Um, I will now give the floor to Jolene. Uh, Jolene, very welcome that you want to talk in your masterclass. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Maurice. And uh, thank you all for uh, attending this uh, masterclass. I'm always uh, happy to uh, talk about the book and share my knowledge, uh, of course, uh, about public procurement. I will um, start sharing my screen now. So you can also see uh, my presentation. So um, do you see the presentation? Maurice? Yes? Okay, very good. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, do not hesitate to ask them, even though there might be time for questions afterwards. Um, if you have an urgent question, um, type it in the chat or raise your hand uh, digitally. Um, as Maurice already explained, I'm Yoni Grandia and I work at Erasmus University uh, in Rotterdam and in particular in the Department of Public Administration. Uh, which means that I don't have a legal background, but I mainly focus on how the organization, how the public organizations um, deal with public procurement and how they are um, organizing it and how the behavior of public procurers can be explained uh, in bringing public procurement into the future. And I'm here to talk to you today, of course, in light of the book that I published together with uh, Leentje Volker and a couple of other uh, colleagues that I will uh, introduce in a couple of minutes. Um, that was published just before the summer. So today I will talk to you shortly about the why, the whom, and the what of the book. So why did we write it, what it is about, and uh, with whom. Um, we also found it very important to write an interdisciplinary book uh, because we feel that public procurement deserves and requires uh, an interdisciplinary perspective because public procurement itself has many different facets. Uh, that require different perspectives. I will also talk to you about that and what it means uh, for the book. I will discuss what public procurement is, what is the definition we uh, use in the book, uh, how do we describe the procurement process and why did we choose uh, to uh, describe and um, design it like that, as well as the development over time of public procurement we have observed uh, and theorized. I will then go towards the end of the book where we also discuss different trends and developments uh, we see um, happening in public procurement and the implications of those trends and developments for practice. Um, and already to shed some light on the potential implications is of course the fact that we need to change more. Um, in order to make that change happen, we need change agents such as uh, Maurice, for example, to help bring uh, public procurement in the future and really use the potential uh, for achieving societal and public value. So um, the book, I wrote a textbook or a study book, um, which is not just a combination of different chapters written by different authors, but a, a singular book on a, a specific topic uh, to combined with learning goals and explanatory cases. Um, although the author team is completely Dutch, uh, we also wrote an English edition to also make sure that in English uh, like, um, education, but also English speakers could read the book. The editions are completely the same. So if you're Dutch, feel free to read the Dutch edition, um, or if you prefer it, you can always read the English edition. Um, they are completely interchangeable. Uh, the book discusses the what and why of public procurement. So what is it and why do we need it? And why is it, for example, so complex compared to private purchasing? 
Um, and we really wanted to write a book about contemporary procurement. Um, a lot of books on purchasing are coming from business administration are, are focused more on the generic uh, parts, but we really want to look into the contemporary public procurement. So what is happening in public procurement and how can we use the potential of public procurement as a tool to also achieve societal value and public value even further. Um, and we are seeing that a couple of very um, honored and well-esteemed colleagues of us were uh, retiring, the Jan Telges and Arjen van Wees. Um, and we saw a new group of scholars emerging and we felt that we could write perhaps a book by the next generation for the next generation of public procurers that were also standing up and also looking to see how they could use public procurement as a, as a tool. Um, so Leentje Volker, who you might also know, who is a full professor of integrated project delivery at the University of Twente, and I edited the book. So together we worked on ensuring there's a storyline, that there's alignment between the different chapters, uh, but all the chapters have been written by the entire author team. Um, in addition to myself and Leentje, Willem Janssen also wrote a chapter. He wrote particularly the legal chapter, um, as he is, will be an endowed professor of public procurement law at Utrecht University. Uh, Lisette Kuitert uh, started um, as the PhD of Leentje um, when we started the book, but by now uh, she is my colleague at Erasmus University and also working as an assistant professor in um, public procurement and governance. Uh, Fredo Schotanus, who you might also know, is, of course, public, uh, professor of public procurement at Utrecht University. And uh, he wrote several chapters also on the strategic parts uh, of how you can organize, for example, uh, public procurement. And Wendy van der Valk, who is Navy professor of purchasing supply chain management, who mainly contributed with her knowledge about contract management. So here you can see shortly the contents of the book, um, the links to the book have been shared in the chat, but are also at the end of the um, of the presentation again, so you can check it out. Um, you can also all read the chapters individually. Although there is a clear storyline, all the chapters also stand by itself. So we discuss, we first introduced the public procurement, what it is. Uh, Lisette wrote a chapter of public values and also the clash between public values that can emerge if you're using it, especially um, to create public values. There might also be a clash between the different public values uh, and then you have to decide what is more important, perhaps safety, sustainability, innovation, um, attracting, uh, using small uh, and medium-sized enterprises, et cetera. Uh, Willem wrote an, an, an ex excellent uh, chapter on public procurement law and the European Union. Uh, when it comes to legal chapters, so of course, always important to look at the context that you're um, in. Um, because we are in the European Union, we felt that it's important that many of our colleagues who are also in the Netherlands or teaching in the EU can use the book. Um, so he wrote it from the perspective of public procurement law in the EU. So for Americans or people from other, from outside the European Union, that might be less relevant, but still the principles uh, might uphold. Uh, Fredo wrote uh, a chapter on public procurement, how it can be organized, as well as strategies. Uh, and together we also wrote about public procurement policies, how they can come about. Um, and the different processes and uh, implementations of those policies. Uh, there's a chapter on tendering supplier selection. How can you uh, design a tender? What is the role of sense making in that tender process and how can you select a supplier? Uh, Randy focused on the whole process of public sector contracting and what makes that so distinct. And in the end, we talk about how we can move forward in public procurement, which is of course also key to the presentation of today. So all the trends and developments that I will be talking about are also discussed in the chapter eight in the book. Um, we wrote an interdisciplinary book on public procurement, um, as you might have already seen from the author team, um, with the exception of um, Lisette and myself, we all work in different departments. Um, some work in the Department of Economics, I work in public administrations, others, for example, in the management or um, uh, technical uh, parts of universities, uh, which means that we have different disciplines as backgrounds. Um, but also we feel that public procurement as, um, as a profession, as a field, requires different perspectives. And in explaining uh, why we need different perspectives, I always use the analogy of the football stadium. Um, and since I'm from Rotterdam, I of course have to show uh, uh, the guide. Um, but uh, if we look at a soccer match uh, and a soccer stadium, you always see that there are multiple lamps. 
And if you want to watch the soccer game, you need those multiple lamps. Otherwise, you will miss part of the of the game. Then you might see that one team scores, but if there's only a lamp on one side of the stage, a stadium, you might miss the other half or the other goals. Or you might not see that the goal doesn't count uh, because the rules were not followed. Or the referee intervened, for example. Um, and the same goes for public procurement. If you only look to the legal aspects, then you might see that the rules are abided by, but then you might miss that the public procurers that are expected to implement those rules are ignoring them or bypassing them. So you also need, for example, a perspective on the organization and how the organization is dealing with the legal rules and regulations. Uh, but you also need to look at society. Because if you're purchasing things for citizens or without citizens, then you might up purchasing a playground that children don't actually use because it doesn't really fit with the desire and the demands of the people that will be using whatever you're buying. Um, and you can only create public value if that's also really something that is valued by the actual public. Um, and finally, we also need a more political perspective. Um, aside from all the differences between legal issues, uh, there is also a main difference between private purchasing and public procurement is, of course, the presence of um, the politics. Um, well, of course, in top management of businesses, there can also be some sort of internal politics. We see that in public procurement, the whole idea of elections, coalitions, um, getting voters um, also really affects the day to day business of how public procurement is goes about. So the, the politics change. And the ideas change and the whole electoral system and voting also affects what is happening in the policy development, for example, or how uh, why certain projects are prioritized and others are not. Um, so therefore, we also need to understand why certain procurement projects happen in a certain way. We also need to look at the politics of it. And of course, a final perspective that is always central to any uh, procurement project um, is the economic process, uh, economic perspective. Because, of course, when it comes down to it, we are spending taxpayers money, we're spending money, and we also need to look at what we're spending, how we're spending it, and why. Um, but we wanted to make sure that all those different perspectives were included in the book. So in the first chapter, you also explain how you can find those different perspectives and in which chapters uh, those different perspectives are uh, shed light on in order to get the full uh, picture of what public procurement is and why it is complex. So you can, in the analogy of the football stadium, take a look at the entire field and watch the entire match without missing any important aspects. So um, I've been talking quite a lot about public procurement and I'm sure many of you are quite aware with what it is, uh, but we felt it was really important to offer a really clear definition of contemporary public procurement also. And in general, of course, um, encompasses the acquisition of work, supplies or services by government or public organizations uh, from the market or another outside body. Um, for example, many public organizations can also be a supplier. For example, when I'm hired to do contract research, for example, then I'm also uh, part of a uh, seller rather than a buyer. While simultaneously creating and safeguarding public value from the perspective of the own organization. And this last edition we felt was really important because this shows that we're not just buying or acquisitioning work, supplies or services uh, for our own sake, but because we want to add value. And this is what distinguishes public procurement from private purchasing also, um, because we are looking at creating and safeguarding public value. So we're spending taxpayers money and we want to create um, value in doing that. And it's quite important that we add the perspective of the own organization, because of course, um, what is considered public value is always up for discussion. Um, and if you ask a farmer, what is public value um, when it comes to procurement, then it might be different from what um, the politician thinks or the organization does or what citizens think. So from the own organization's perspective. This is, of course, what public procurement was. But then we also want to discuss what the process of procuring looks like in the public sector. And in this, uh, we use the 3P model. For those of you who might have attended uh, Fredos, Gotades or um, Orazi, might have also seen this already, this uh, model, um, as he was also involved in the development of it. But we felt it was really important to use a cyclical model because we feel that the cycle really shows that no 
uh, procurement or purchase happens without a context or a shadow of the past. Uh, we feel that it's important to, if you're going to explore a need, there's always a history. Um, and you might want to look back at what was bought before. Why do we have the needs? How did we evaluate the previous one? And therefore, we feel that any procurement should be placed in a cycle where you could start by exploring a need and deciding how you want to procure it and if you even want to procure it or if you might be able to share it, for example, uh, and step outside uh, the procurement process, followed by the initiation of a procurement the tendering process, assessment of the tenders, and then a move to the implementation where you implement the contract. Uh, we also find it important also to highlight here the closing of a social contract. Of course, the closing of a legal contract is quite uh, well known, but especially in very complex and innovative um, um, procurements, there is often a more a partnership. And if you're collaborating more and perhaps running into new situations that you could not find in advance, it's also important to so close a social contract where you decide on how you're going to interact with each other. How are we going to deal with unexpected things? And that is something that you write in a social contract, which is not as well, firm as a legal contract, but is about how you are going to deal with each other. Then, of course, is the execution of the procurement, where you also need to manage the buyer-supplier relationships, preferably according to the social contract you closed earlier. And in many cases, and also in practice, we see that it often ends here. The product was delivered, the service was ended, it's all fine, everything is paid and we're done. Uh, but then, especially in terms of goods or, for example, buildings, we also need to look at, can we um, repurpose the building? Can we reuse what we bought? Can we perhaps repair it and extend the life cycle? Um, but also evaluating and reporting. It might be very easy to say, well, we're done. I don't have time. Let's move to the next procurement. Um, but if you don't evaluate what went well and uh, what didn't go so well, it might be uh, that you have to reinvent the wheel time and time again. Uh, so in order to prevent from reinventing the wheel, it's very important to look at what do we still have um, and how can we evaluate it and also report it. And also for, in terms of bringing uh, procurement in the future and bringing it into a new era, um, looking at refurbishing and reusing and repairing what we already have and not tossing it away um, is quite important. Um, and interestingly love it, a lot of things that we're seeing that are quite common to do in your own household, um, that when, for example, you have paid off your phone, uh, you do look at, can I still use it for a number of years? Um, can I perhaps get a, a SIM only uh, subscription uh, and continue to use my phone is not so common yet in many organizations, where if the phone, is, the phone is paid off, you get a new one, you get an automated email message saying we can, you can pick up your new phone, um, which is, of course, a waste. Um, and perhaps we could extend it. So step seven uh, is also quite important and also input for the next step, because perhaps if the life cycle didn't turn out to be long enough, if there's a lot of repairs necessary during the duration of the life cycle, perhaps we need to buy something else and we need to take that into consideration for the next procurement. That was the procurement process of individual procurements. Public procurement as a management function has also developed over time. So this goes beyond individual procurements. We've seen that, especially in the Netherlands, for example, perhaps in the 1950s, um, procurement was more nothing more than fulfilling a need. An organization needed chairs to sit on, so we're going to buy chairs and we pay and that's it. After that came compliance with legislation, for example, in the prevention of corruption um, and ad adhering to uh, existing regulation. The development of public procurement is not something that is general for all organizations or all countries. There are many countries in the world or organizations that might still be stuck at level one, uh, that are still really working on trying to comply with legislation, but are still battling corruption in doing so. So this is a model where you can plot yourself or your organization on one of the different stages, um, but not all stages are the same. And especially as we're going towards the higher end of the public procurement stages, uh, it might mean that certain projects are lower within an organization as other projects are higher. Um, within the European Union, step one, two, four are often also embedded in the European directives and, for example, uh, require certain types of accountability and transparency towards citizens, but also to create a level playing field within the EU. 
So for many European countries, the fourth level is required, although, of course, we do know uh, of many examples where they're still uh, struggling to comply with legislation and preventing corruption. Um, one to four are basically mostly oriented at making sure that there is an accountable, efficient uh, and compliant procurement process. Uh, afterwards, we start looking at seeing how proper procurement is changing into a tool, a tool where we can also use it to create value. Initially, it was also aimed at creating value for the organization. For example, if you're going to buy chairs, you might as well buy ergonomic chairs that are very comfortable for your uh, employees to sit on. So they might have less backache, for example, and can do their work better. So by buying ergonomic chairs, you might create value internally for the organization. Next step is buying in a certain way that you also create value for society. Perhaps you can buy economic chairs secondhand, and then you don't have to buy something new, uh, but also contributing to the environment by well, consuming less. The final stage that we added and that is becoming more and more common, especially in the in the built environment, is collaborative value creation. Um, often we procure goods or services, for example, for citizens. By involving those citizens into what is being procured, we ensure that there is inclusiveness in what is being procured. There is equity um, and equality. Um, and for example, that if you're procuring a playground in the inner city, that if you collaborate with the children and the parents that are living in a neighborhood, you can actually make sure that the playground that is being built uh, also meets the needs and desires of the specific children living in that neighborhood. Perhaps there are children that are less able-bodied than other children and it might also want to play in that specific playground. So you can collaboratively see where, how you can build an inclusive playground. Um, so collaborative value creation is currently the highest stage of public procurement, but we see that it is an ongoing trend. Um, so for now, we end at stage seven, but hopefully in the future, we can be able to move public procurement even further and see uh, if we can add other ways of uh, using the potential of public procurement um, to establish public value and societal impact. Well. In the development of public procurement, we also see more general trends and developments. And if you also think that we want to move forward for public procurement, we need to do things even further to go beyond stage seven, perhaps. Um, and in doing so, we've seen, especially in the Netherlands, that we've moved from efficiency and cost-based thinking more towards value-driven and sustainable, so more towards the higher levels of public procurement. I will discuss each trend and development more in detail and uh, first uh, introduce them. Um, we also see a development of going from administrative and operational public procurement to more digitalized and smart. From front end practical purchasing towards life cycle engagement. And from more dyadic supply chain relations to relational ecosystems. So if we go to the first trend where we see efficiency and cost based thinking being replaced by value driven and sustainable. Um, we see that lowest price is still in many countries and often in situations still the norm. It's important to buy something for the least amount of money. But um, what is often forgotten in that case is that we can use it to drive innovation, stimulate e equality, inclusiveness and diversity, and also reduce the impact of production and consumption. Um, but that means that you also change the way you think about procurement and uh, go towards a value-driven and sustainable perspective on that procurement. This requires you to do things differently inside the procurement process, but also inside the organization. This means that you have to opt for more innovative solutions that the market might already be offering, or for example, challenge the market to um, offer such or develop such innovative solutions. And it also requires that legal frameworks are developed that actually stimulate that certain kind of behavior. Uh, we're, for example, seeing that the European directives are already moving in a direction and um, making sustainable social procurement a new standard by making sure that there is room to choose for such innovative solutions, also from a legal perspective. Um, in the book, Willem also really discusses the different ways in which you can um, choose for a more sustainable and innovative uh, public procurement and the room that the law already provides for that and what is important to, to consider there. Um, it is difficult that the perception often is that sustainable or innovative is more expensive. Um, I have to say that in the Netherlands, 
duurzaam, of course, already uh, contains the word duur or expensive. So it might be easy to think that it is more expensive. Um, this can, of course, be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. For example, in the, um, the example I gave earlier of buying uh, secondhand office furniture means that it might be cheaper than buying completely brand new furniture, for example. Um, difficult is also that often um, on the bottom line, something might be cheaper. Um, for example, um, the LED light bulbs used to be quite expensive. They're becoming more and more affordable right now, but in the beginning they were quite expensive. Um, so the purchase price was higher, but of course they used much less energy. So over the life cycle of the product, they might be cheaper um, than the regular um, non-sustainable light bulbs. However, if we see, especially in the large ministries, for example, that the maintenance budgets are completely separate from the purchase budgets. Um, and that means that if the purchase budget is going over budget because they are buying a more expensive sustainable alternative, it might save money in the maintenance budget. Those budgets are not communicating already, or those are in different departments. And of course, with such polarization, it's really difficult to see how we can um, move towards those sustainable budgets, especially in a system uh, where emptying budgets or using all the budget we have um, is also still the norm from a financial perspective. The second trend. Um, we are also think, feeling that public procurement needs to move away from the administrative and operational uh, procurement processes towards digitalized and smart. Um, and at the moment, and especially even since writing the book, uh, technological innovations and digitalization are going super fast. Um, when we wrote the book, we had no idea that ChatGTP would be so present and omnipresent uh, in all of our works, uh, but it has. Uh, and the emergence of artificial intelligence, for example, uh, but also other technologies really affects also how we do, um, how we can organize the procurement process. Um, artificial intelligence tools can be used, for example, to support and optimize the entire procurement process, uh, freeing up time, for example, to organize to write text or organize uh, documents and create time for public procurements to think more about the strategic parts. So perhaps about how they can actually challenge suppliers um, to come up with innovative uh, solutions uh, and taking away uh, time from the more generic answering, for example, automated uh, giving um, answering questions. We're already seeing examples of more automated replies, for example, um, to questions being asked during the tender process. And while, of course, ChatGTP itself uh, raises a lot of questions regarding, for example, privacy um, and, and can we enter documents and data into ChatGTP and what does it what does it mean for privacy? We're also seeing that a lot of developments are looking at, for example, building um, individual artificial intelligence bots. Um, I have a colleague who is working on who has built a sort of ChatGTP for himself using his own documents and data. Uh, without external uh, impact to sort of build a chatbot where he can write teaching cases um, based on all the, all the policy documents that are entered. Um, well, we're expecting that similar developments will also be shaping and uh, perhaps already shaping how public procurers are writing tender documents, for example. Um, however, those technological advancements um, can also really affect the power balance between buyer and seller. Uh, for example, especially in the procurement of technological innovations, um, the seller might be operating also the innovation that might be gathering a lot of information and data. Um, if they are keeping that to themselves, uh, they might know, for example, how everything is working, how often things are breaking down, uh, and the buyer might not be aware. So with the use of more technology, uh, the power balance between buyer and seller might also be shifting. It's so important, therefore, to understand that the use and the move towards more digitalized and smart procurement, um, including uh, the use of chatbots and AI, also requires consideration of who owns the data, how will we will manage the data, do we have a data sharing agreement um, to make sure that it's clear upfront um, how we are going to deal with data-driven intellectual property, and what are also security as aspects. So um, can we, for example, use ChatGTP 
to actually write our tender documents and what are privacy and security aspects in doing so. The third trend is more from front-end practical purchasing to lifecycle engagement. This also refers back to the developmental stages of public procurement. Um, if we want to more go towards the lifecycle engagement and looking beyond the use single use of a product, tossing it away and then buying something new, uh, we also have to change our routines. Um, and as with any organization, an organizational process, procurement is also combined of many different organizational routines, things that a public procurers and contract manager or uh, principals are very used to doing. They are used to doing it in a certain way and changing that requires a routine change. That means that the questions you ask yourself also have to change. So instead of automatically replacing something when the life cycle ends or buying something new when a need arises, we need to change um, the way you think about it. And we need to look for alternatives. For example, as buying as a service, perhaps we can share it with another organization. Maybe we can actually extend the lifetime and reuse. However, that means that already starting at the make or buy decision, you have to ask a different question. It might not be, am I going to make it or buy it? But it might also be, are, am I going to share it or reuse it? Or maybe I am not going to make it or not going to buy it at all. Maybe we don't actually need it. Um, and we can just keep what we have. Um, this really does also require a life cycle perspective. And that means that everybody who is involved somewhere in the procurement process also needs to have that life cycle perspective. And that already means that in the make or buy decision, different questions have to be asked. And that also means that procurement and contract management are organized differently. For example, if a contract manager sees that the lifetime of the product or service that are using might be extended, um, then they need to talk to the people that are going to start the new procurement process, perhaps automated, um, whether or not that is useful and necessary and have uh, discussions about that. Um, those discussions at the moment are starting to be held within public organizations, but are still quite far in the future. Uh, but if you really want to go towards life cycle engagement, that also means that everybody involved in the procurement process has such a perspective. And the fourth and final trend we discussed in the book is the move from a dyadic supply chain relations towards more relational ecosystems. We see that very often policies, law, but also internal procedures often have the, the standard uh, dyadic relationship between one buyer and one seller in mind. Of course, we see that there are more collaborative strategies or joint procurement strategies, but they often still imply a buyer signs a contract with one particular supplier. However, we are in turbulent times and there are not just pandemics, but also climate change and many different developments within society and a world that require more adaptivity. Um, and for example, more adaptive service-based contracts that allow us to sort of play better into the different ways of working that uh, employees, for example, have the different expectations that citizens might have of, for example, public services and also require better adaptivity to collaboration agreements to match to really the dynamic of society's needs for public value. And traditional contracts are often um, well, not adaptive enough to really deal with those dynamics. Um, we are viewing ecosystems as a collaborative arrangements through which interconnected and independent public and private net network actors can actually combine their individual offers or ex um, expertise or solutions focused on value creation. But that means that there is not one single relationship with, with a contract between one buyer and a supplier. Think for example, in this case, as the SBR developments um, where people are working uh, collaboratively together. Now, of course, the developments of such more network and ecosystem-based arrangements also have legal and economic perspectives because how are we going to um, is it allowed legally? Can we also uh, arrange this financially? What does it mean if I borrow something from you, for example, rather than um, buying it new? Uh, what kind of uh, arrangements do we need to have and how can we actually work together? Um, we feel that this is the way of the future where we can move um, and really use what is uh, already present um, in the organizations. Uh, and it's really necessary to bring public procurement towards the future and move beyond procurement as just being something about buying something new from the market 
uh, but that does really uh, require all the other aspects of the procurement process to move along. So um, all these developments, of course, also have implications, many of whom are already discussed, but there are also really some uh, important ones. Uh, we also need more flexi flexible and adaptive ways of governing buyer-supplier relationships, especially in light of, for example, innovative and innovation and in procurement of innovations, um, you're buying something new. And if you're buying something new and innovative, by definition, um, you are less experienced with what is going to happen. So you might run into more questions, situations or issues that need discussing. Um, for this, as a, cover, as a buyer and a supplier, you need to have a more flexible arrangement. How are we going to deal with certain expectations? It might not work. What do we do if it doesn't work? And how will, will we deal with that? For this, we need more flexible and adaptive ways of how we can go about that. For example, more in the range of relational governance and relational contracting versus the more traditional contract-oriented uh, way of monitoring, for example, performance. We also need to integrate procurement values in all parts of the public organization. We often see that, for example, in a mission statement, a ministry says, well, sustainability or innovation is really important. Um, but then uh, when it comes to the financial department or the economic department or um, perhaps even uh, the project manager or the contract manager, I think, well, yes, of course, sustainability is quite important. But first, we need to finish in time or it needs to be within budget. Um, it also means that in every part of the procurement process, you need to embed, embed those values. Uh, for example, when it comes to sustainability, um, if you really want to have a sustainable alternative, you need to start to make or buy decision because of course the most sustainable thing might be not buying anything at all. Um, and that means that you need to make that decision right at the beginning when you decide if you're going to buy something at all, um, rather than uh, when the tender document has already been written. Because, of course, if the tender document has already been written, there might still be something of value you can add, or maybe you can make it slightly more innovative or sustainable. But that just means that maybe we can still um, opt to add some solar panels to the design or um, see if we can um, choose for a product that is made out of recycled materials. Um, but the truly innovative and sustainable choices are made earlier in the procurement process. For that, everybody... Uh, needs to be involved and it also means that different procurement values need to be embedded in all parts of the organization, not just in the procurement team. We see that in practice, public procurement is often synonymous with a single public procurer, whereas the actual procurement process, of course, embedded is embedded in many more different parts of the organization. Because the procurement process is going to change, we also need different capabilities and competences, not only because we're seeing, for example, the digital um, transformation and the developments and technology uh, um, developments. Um, for example, of course, if you're going to work with an e-invoicing system, you need different capabilities and be able to deal with such an e-invoicing system. Um, but also if you're going to work more, for example, in a relational type, then with a supplier, you also need to be able to talk to your supplier and not just focus on receiving performance indicators and monitoring data, but also be able to have a meaningful discussion and constructive discussion with suppliers about how you're going to solve it. Um, this really does mean that the procurers also need to be different kinds of procurers rather than the operational, more technical, um, tender writing uh, procurers they might be in the past. And they also need to be able to relinquish perhaps some of the well, choices to the suppliers. Um, and in research, we're currently seeing that many public procurers and contract managers as well are quite risk averse. Um, they are quite scared of, for example, entering into a legal issue or having uh, potential um, tendering parties uh, issue a lawsuit. Um, and out of fear of such lawsuits, they might opt for the most safe uh, option which is often not the most sustainable or innovative. Um, so if you really want to move forward, we also need public procurers that have different capabilities and are, for example, less risk averse and, and daring to move beyond um, choosing the safest option. We also need to rebalance the multiple perspectives on public procurement. We've seen that in the past, the economic and legal perspective were most dominant. 
And of course, we are spending taxpayers' money, so we can spend it uh, without thinking or consideration. But if you're looking at, for example, achieving societal value, it might mean actually spending a little bit more to acquire extra, um, actually more value for society. Um, if you're going to buy a playground that really meets the demands and desires of the children in the neighborhood, you might actually be spending money that, on a playground that is being used quite frequently. Whereas if you're just buying uh, the cheapest playground that there might be in a sort of catalog, perhaps they might be not using it because it might not be adapted to the children that are actually living there. And then you're spending perhaps less money, but it's not being used. So you're not really, uh, actually achieving any public or social societal value. This also means that we need to rebalance the perspectives. It also means that if we want to do something innovative, we might have to be okay with not choosing the legals uh, from a legal perspective, the safest option. We might be able to say, well, we are going to try this and it might up in a, in a lawsuit, but then uh, we have to take a first step and see if this is possible. So we need to also be okay with, um, for example, prioritizing societal value or uh, slightly higher now perhaps the economic or legal film or perspectives. Um, also, as I stated earlier, in public procurement, the, pol the political uh, perspective is also quite apparent. And there we're seeing that, of course, within the electoral system, and the, um, we see that often the perspectives of politicians um, on what they deem is important or what they think the buyer or the citizens find important or the voters also affects the procurement processes. Um, because, of course, in theory, every four years there are new elections. In practicality, it's often even uh, more frequent, as we've seen this summer. Um, this also really shapes how long people are able to think ahead. How long can we pre work ahead? Um, and this, of, of course, also creates some sort of risk aversion. Um, because if we're at the forefront of a new election, we might not be so willing to venture into something new and innovative. Um, this also means that we have to look towards the long term uh, rather than the short term um, focused on uh, well voting and um, getting into the on the good side of the voters if we really want to achieve public value in the long run. Well, in short, this basically comes down to the point that we need to do things differently. Well, doing differently um, is of course very difficult. And in my own research, both my PhD research and my more recent research, I've seen that um, often people play an important role in achieving that change. And there in my research, I noticed that one particular actor um, stood out. In many of the more successful cases where most more sustainable procurement was, for example, implemented or more innovative solution for chosen, change agents were present. And they often would never call themselves change agents, but those were people that were involved somewhere in that procurement process who volunteered to do something more than their job description actually said. And they were able to increase the willingness and ability of those around them or those in the procurement process by initiating, for example, by saying, well, hey, did you think of this solution or have you asked the supplier to maybe do this or have you read about this development? Um, just saying something about, hey, did you know, uh, they were also able to plant a little seed in the minds uh, of those involved in the procurement process. They could also motivate, uh, not just as a sort of motivational speaker, but also sort of speak enthusiastically about the notion of sustainability or innovation can already um, change things, informing them of you know, policies, available documentation, um, advising on how to deal with certain issues. Uh, but also problem solving. I've seen that change agents might sometimes um, make sure that well, innovations or sustainable alternatives were chosen simply by arranging for, for example, for software to be bought that could calculate the carbon uh, monoxide emissions, for example, for CO2 emissions. Solving very small problems might be able to help somebody across um, towards a more sustainable alternative. Uh, without those small little problems being solved, they might still be stuck um, at the other end of the sort of canyon. And if you want to go ahead, then you need a little help from a little light bulb, perhaps, or a little change agent. And change agents sounds like a really sort of management term, uh, but basically they are just mainly change leaders. 
And while the word leader might be synonymous to managers, um, in research, we see that those change agents or change leaders do not have to be managers at all. Um, often it's even better if they're not. They can be any person inside or outside the organization, or it can also be a complete team that is responsible for initiating, sponsoring, directing, managing, or implementing a specific change, uh, a project or a complete change program. So it's basically anybody who's involved in the procurement process who feels called um, to make that change happen. And even initiating a small um, idea that you have or asking people if they have thought about something or referring them perhaps to a colleague who was uh, known for um, doing something successful could make change. I've, for example, seen that in the city of Copenhagen, there was an example of a meeting where they suddenly invited the sustainability officer uh, to attend a, for, uh, a, a very early on project meeting about the catering contract. The fact that that person was invited to sit at the desk at the, at the table and talk to them meant that they were able to suggest, for example, um, alternative, more organic or sustainable solutions or choices for the catering contract. And those were implemented. Um, the procurer said, we did not know about those alternatives and solutions, um, but we're really happy to hear about them. And the fact that we invited them to be sit at our table when we were discussing how we could go about uh, the new contract for catering uh, really helped. So in this case, the fact that they invited a single person to attend a meeting already resulted in a much, much, much more sustainable uh, procurement. Um, so even those small changes can have a large impact. So um, this brings me to my final slide and then I have some time for a question still. Uh, we see that public procurement is developing. It's no longer the operational administrative fulfillment of a need, uh, but there's still much change to be made. And if we really want to bring public procurement more into the future, we need more change. And that change needs to happen all inside, at all aspects of the organization, including in the behavior of those involved. Um, for this, we need change agents. They can help overcome hurdles and they can make the necessary change happen. In my research, I did see that those change agents are not always loved for their intervening or um, suggestions. And that people might think, well, oh, there, there he is or there she is again with their suggestion. Um, that might be the case, but we need to embody, embrace them a little bit more uh, because those actions um, are also the things that help us think about the solutions and innovations and actually make them happen. Um, and we've seen in research that everybody can become a change agent. So I would also like to end this presentation with a small call to you um, to see if you will be one. Uh, even a small suggestion uh, can bring about change or inviting a colleague from a sustainability department to your meetings might make change. So um, join us in uh, bringing public procurement into the future. And if you want to read uh, more about it, then you can uh, go to the books. They're free of charge. You can download them as many times as you want and also share them. Um, if you prefer hard copies, less sustainable, of course, uh, but these are still also available uh, and you can also still buy one.